Imagine a race that's flat out. No horsepower limits, no paved roads, no barriers. Just pure racing adrenaline flying through a narrow forest. Group B Rally is one of the most thrilling motorsports that the world has ever seen. But when not only drivers, but also spectators started dying, it quickly became the most dangerous. So let's dig into Group B Rally and see how it went from being a racing team's dream to the entire racing industry's worst nightmare. I'm Guff, this is Albon, let's give away $1,000. We're doing it again, and this time it's the last month of our giveaway, so don't forget to hit subscribe and drop a comment below to get entered to win 1000 bucks. For the discerning automobile enthusiast of the 20th century, rally was always a staple. And all the way through the 1960s, the Monte Carlo rally always was the prestige event. But it was in the 1960s that elegance and comfort took a back seat. Drivers got bored, spectators got bored. As cars got faster and more robustly engineered, the once elegant rally quickly became dull. People wanted something else. And so with the FIA, drivers took the special stage rally and created WRC in 1973. The World Rally Championship, the pinnacle of rally racing. And at the head of this shift was the Federación Internacional del Automobil, the FIA. And the FIA's job was simple, to represent drivers and to oversee international motorsports events. They decided who could race and who couldn't. And with WRC, the world was finally seeing what these drivers and their cars were truly capable of. WRC blew up and thus began the golden age of rally racing, a time with insane cars and even more insane driving. Truly the best and sharpest drivers paired with the nuttiest automotive engineers, like Lancia and their Stratos HF who dominated so badly that the rules had to change, or Renault's 5 Turbo, which proved to the world that you didn't have to start from a blank slate like Lancia to compete in WRC. And then, of course, there's Audi, a factory team that was laughed at for bringing all-wheel drive to a two-wheel drive game. Back then, all-wheel drive technology was pretty basic. And when people saw the Audi Quattro, they thought it would be too heavy, too complex of a system. But just the fact that you even know what the word Quattro is, is proof enough that Audi had come up with something truly special back then. But that era of rally was quickly coming to an end in the late 70s. Because just like before, drivers were getting bored with the current class limitations and they asked the FIA for some changes. And this time, even the car manufacturers were on their side. And the timing couldn't be better because Jean-Marie Balestra had just been elected president of the FIA's International Sporting Committee in 1978. And Balestra had a reputation of getting his way. And he was someone that was always ready to break the rules if he thought it was the right thing to do. Some called Balestra a visionary. Others called him a Nazi. He'd call himself a survivor, and then he'd sue you for defamation if you said otherwise. But we're not here to talk about the strange personality that was Balestra, we're here to talk about Group B Rally. So when drivers and manufacturers went to Balestra and asked him for less oversight and less restriction, Balestra saw dollar signs. Out went the old Groups 1 through 6 classification. And in its place, Group N, Group A, and of course, Group B. But speaking of B, you better be ready to save some money with today's sponsor, PayPal Honey. This is Steve. I'm filing for bankruptcy. And why is that, Steve? I don't have any money anymore. I spend it all on car parts. Car parts? I just couldn't control myself. Brakes, exhausts, short shifters, I just had to have it all. I spent so much money that I couldn't pay my car note. So they took my car away. So now you got all these parts and no car to put it on? Yeah. If only I could have saved money on all these parts, maybe I'd still have my car. Well, my friend, you could have used Honey. Honey? Yeah, Honey, the free online shopping tool. Honey is as vital to a mod crazy gearhead like yourself as his 10 millimeter socket. It automatically finds promo codes for all the things you're already shopping for. Tools, parts, fluids, you name it. Honey is there to find you a discount. I wish you told me about this earlier. Maybe I'd still have my car. You sure would. <laughs> so don't be like Steve. Just add Honey to your browser for free at joinhoney.com slash and start saving today. 
Group B was the class that drivers and manufacturers had begged the FIA for. It was the anything goes free for all, have your cake and have Nikocado avocado eat it too class. It replaced both the Group 3 and Group 4 classes. And it was the perfect recipe for a sport that was growing faster than Formula One in its prime. Factories finally got to flaunt their engineering talent. And drivers were now able to prove that they could drive anything, anywhere. And the FIA and Balestra, well, they had a smash hit in the making. But that's not to say that Group B didn't have some rules. Cars still had a minimum legal weight, tires couldn't exceed a maximum width, and the car still needed a roof and enough space to fit two drivers. But that was basically it. There were no rules on design. You could make the car as big or as small as you please. Use whatever materials you wanted. Oh, and of course, the power. The power was limitless. Strap on a turbocharger or a supercharger help. Put both on. The only caveat was that your horsepower number would classify you into subgroups, which were designed to maintain even competition in Group B. And as far as homologation rules go, manufacturers only had to make 200 road cars from their Group B race cars within 12 months' time, way less than the 5,000 road cars required for Group A. And if you made a change to your Group B race car the very next year, you only had to make 10% more road cars to make your Evolution model race car legal to race, which unlocked the ability for teams to make improvements year over year. And oh boy, did the manufacturers show up. Audi brought their Quattro DNA into Group B with the A1 in 1983, a 340 horsepower turbocharged inline five monster that weighed under 2,500 pounds. But then there was Lancia. Their rivalry with Audi in the 1983 season was an unforgettable moment in racing history. The Lancia Rally 037 was built as a dedicated, ground-up race car for Group B. It was mid-engined, rear-wheel drive designed with the help of Pininfarina and Abarth. And it was the unofficial successor to the Lancia Stratos that changed the game years ago. At its debut, it rocked a two-liter four-cylinder engine that made 265 horsepower. And it was that Lancia that bested Audi to win the very first Group B season in 1983. Audi's loss left a little bit of a sour taste in their mouth. So naturally, they went back to the drawing board and came out with an evolution model, the Quattro A2. And although it didn't end up taking the title the very next year, it did set a new precedent. Audi was updating their car far faster than any other race team was. And with these new FIA rules, it was totally legal. And just halfway through the very next year, Audi released the Sport Quattro S1. And this, this was the Audi. The S1 was the most powerful car in their lineup with 444 horsepower through a 2.1 liter inline five. But this was group B, baby. And everyone was gunning to be king of the hill. Midway through the 84 season, Peugeot homologated its 205 T16 race car. This was one of the craziest cars that rally racing had ever seen. It had an inline four that made over five 500 horsepower, thanks to three bar of boost pushing through a Garrett turbocharger. It set the fastest time record immediately at its first event and went on to win the WRC Manufacturers Championship in 85 and 86. But there's an asterisk to that 1986 season that I'll get to later. Of course, along with every great car was a great driver, like Timo Salonen, the winningest driver in Group B, who dominated that Peugeot 205 T16. Or Stig Blomqvist, one of the drivers behind Audi's dominance, along with Hanu Mikula, of course. Then there's Marco Allen at Lancia with Walter Roll, or Juha Kankunen, the 1986 champion with Peugeot. And of course, we can't go on without recognizing the queen of the hill, Michelle Mouton. She never won anything outright in WRC, but before Group B, she took the gold at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. She helped Audi win their first manufacturer's title in 1982, and set the hill climb record at Pikes Peak in 1985. All these drivers, along with their iconic cars and the thrilling racing, was why Group B was more popular than Formula One. 100,000, 200,000, sometimes even 400,000 people showed up to the scheduled WRC races. Spectators spilled over from the sidelines lines onto the course itself. Everyone wanted to get as close as possible for the perfect vantage of the cars sliding by. And if you were in the way, well, you better move fast. Team mechanics would often see cars come back with blood stains torn hair caught in the body panels, and sometimes even fingers. And as Group B got more and more popular, being a spectator became more and more sketchy. But maybe that was to be expected. At its core, Group B was inherently dangerous. And even though Group B was what the drivers and manufacturers had asked for, 
things were turning sour rather quickly. Drivers were starting to fear for their safety. And look, it was one thing that the cars were ridiculously fast with relatively little safety equipment, but the unpredictable spectators added a whole new element of danger. Drivers were constantly complaining to the FIA that things were being thrown at their cars. Obstacles were being placed on track. Gravel was being added to the apex of corners to upset the car's balance. The racing committee that they were talking to, that was FISA. Jean-Marie Balestra and the FIA's governing body of motorsport. And well, FISA didn't exactly make it better. They agreed with drivers that the racing was getting more and more precarious, but they didn't really do anything about it. Races weren't canceled, spectators weren't limited. With the huge amount of cash flow that Group B was generating, FISA saw the danger as a risk that was acceptable. Well, that is, until it wasn't. On May 2nd, 1985, Tragedy struck during the Tour de Corsa rally when the Lancia 037 flew off track directly into a tree. The roof was torn off by the tree limbs. The car was totally mangled. The co-driver, Maurizio, made it out okay and limped back to the course to flag down oncoming cars. It took ambulances 20 minutes to arrive on scene, but even if they had come faster, it was pointless. Because the driver, Attilo Bottega, was killed on impact. This tragic event forced the entire rally world to take a step back and petition the FIA for some real changes. And while everyone's safety concerns were heard by the officials, ultimately the FIA ruled that the severity of the crash was due to too much speed, and Attilo was killed at no fault to the car's structure or safety devices. So the racing continued. But later that season, Ari Vatanen crashed in Argentina. His car flipped over and he broke his legs, his ribs and even punctured a lung. He and his co-pilot both may have survived, but Ari never raced in Group B again. At this point, Balestra and the FIA were forced to change the rules. Inaction would be borderline criminal. So going into the 1986 season, aluminum roll cages became illegal, and now there were more rules on aerodynamics and spoilers. That was really it. Nothing on spectators or barriers or horsepower or size. And that's probably because an entirely new rally group was in the works for the upcoming season. Group S. And this, this was Jean-Marie Balestra's newest love child. It was to be the replacement to Group B. But it wasn't a stricter version like the drivers were asking for. It had an even lower barrier to entry than Group B. One that only required 10 road cars to be homologated for a race car to be legal. Which meant that manufacturers basically would have no excuse not to race. It was another attempt from Balestra to grow the cash cow that was Group B racing. But before Group S could come to fruition, the tragedies kept coming in Group B. This time, it was the Portugal rally in March. Now, Portugal was infamous for their love of motorsports. Niki Lauda beat Alain Prost by half a point here. Senna's first ever win was in Portugal. And it's safe to say that a Group B rally in Portugal was a serious event. Around 400,000 spectators showed up to witness the racing. And there were two incidents. The first, in retrospect, was fairly minor. Timo Salonen hit a cameraman with the rear of his Peugeot 205. The cameraman was badly hurt, but he lived to tell the tale and Timo was able to finish the rally. And while you could blame the cameraman for being far too close to the stage itself, it's not like he had anywhere else to stand. There were just too many people on the sidelines. But that accident, was all but forgotten. Because not long after, Joaquim Santos was launching off the start line in his Ford RS200. Santos was Portugal's very own driver, the hometown boy who finally had his chance to shine. But two miles into this 1500 mile rally, everything went wrong. Santos says a spectator stepped onto the track in front of his car, forcing him to swerve out of the way, but when he tried to swerve back, the car was already too far gone. His co-driver, Miguel Oliveira, remembers the moment vividly. He said that when you're a co-driver, everything happens too fast. You're forced to look down and read your pace notes and just feel the course around you. But after that swerve, all there was was bump after bump after bump. He didn't see it, but he felt it all. Those bumps, were the car running over the people in the crowd. When the car finally stopped, Santos was in the driver's seat, laying still with his head on the steering wheel. Not dead or injured, just frozen from shock. 32 people were injured and three people died 
including a mother and her 11-year-old child. To this day, there's still mixed accounts of what happened, but that doesn't change the outcome of that terrible event. And while the deaths of innocent bystanders was heartbreaking, no doubt, the hardest part to stomach was that the race went on. The drivers staged at the top of the rally didn't know what happened until they passed that gruesome scene. The other drivers had to get to the finish line just to flag down the safety team. And it's said that 11 more cars still raced even after the crash. When the racing teams found out what happened, they banded together and left for the hotel for a strike. They signed a handwritten letter to the FISA officials. And that letter had one demand to stop the rally. And surely the unified call from the various teams, along with the clear proof that this race was too dangerous, was more than enough to convince the officials. Audi even vowed to pull out completely, promising to never come back until the safety concerns were addressed. But the letter didn't work. Balestra and the officials wanted the teams to know that they were in charge. And so the rally wasn't stopped. It continued on for the entire weekend. And Balestra went so far as to say that he would punish teams that refused to race. And so group B continued, somehow surviving another grievous incident. But just two months later, the final nail would be put in the Group B coffin. At the Tour de Corsa in France, Henry Tovenin was piloting the Lancia Delta S4 and he was winning stage after stage. But between stages, Henry himself told interviewers how bad it was out there. And during his second day of racing, Henry and his Lancia went off a sharp left corner with no guardrail overlooking a steep hill. The car landed upside down. The fuel tank ruptured and the car exploded. Henry Tovenin and his co-driver Sergio Cresto died in that burning lancha. And it wasn't until a number of other cars had crossed the finish line that their team began to get worried that something had happened. The finishing drivers mentioned that they had seen black smoke at the edge of one of the turns, and so a rescue team was sent out to find them. But when they got there, all they could do was quell the flames. Both of the drivers were gone. And while there's plenty of controversy surrounding that day, any criticisms of Henry's driving is just misdirection. The world had finally seen enough from Group B, and Balestra and his committee now had no choice. After this season, Group B was to be officially banned forever. FISA conducted an investigation and claimed that the driver's reaction times were just too slow for how fast the Group B cars had become. But that was just them passing on the blame. Group B cars could have had better fuel cells, better roll cages, spectators could have been limited, barriers could have been put in place, and most important of all, the officials could have just listened to the damn drivers. Watching footage of Group B racing in this day and age is mesmerizing. It is truly racing at its most extreme, its most impressive. But the cost for a sport like that was just too high for all of those involved. Today, rally continues, but in the way that those drivers of yesteryear had pushed for. Safer cars, better courses, and far fewer spectators. We really have learned from the difficult lessons of Group B. But even still, one can't help but look back at that era with awe and admiration because those cars, those drivers, those acts of pure driving heroism are moments that racing fans can never forget. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and drop a comment below for your chance to win $1,000. And check out PayPal Honey at the link in the description. You can also find us on Instagram or at our Discord linked below the like button. I'll see you guys in the next one.